absolutely refuse. One person now. Yeah. 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 So why, like that, why are you here? <laughs> Do you, do you know who this person is? So we can sit. Okay. Do you want me to sit or sit? So we can sit. We can sit on these slightly uncomfortable, squishy, bouncy things, and we can bounce up and down a little right. bit, like pogo sticks. Is the idea. So, 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 so on previous years we've got uh, photographs of Long Meadow and we've gone through, but, but basically. Monty says he was too busy, actually, he was too idle to put me together this year. You know, his, his gallery's known me a long time. I, I was actually working like a dog, I was... Or, working with a dog? I was working with a dog, yeah. Um, no, we, I had been filming an awful lot, I was going to prepare pictures, it was late at night, and I emailed James and I said, how would you feel if we didn't do any pictures this year, but maybe you might have to dance? He said, well, some shoes are ready. So if things go a bit flat, it's going to go for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but as, as an alternative, who follows Monty on Instagram? Yes? Mm. Yeah, so I thought we'd just go through his Instagram feed. Does that sound like a good idea? And we'll see what comes up. Because it's sort of different. It's not the same. Well, the thing about Instagram uh, is that obviously it's my, I only do mainly stuff in my own garden. So it's my view of what I see or that I like or has just caught my eye or I just think looks nice um, in the garden at any given time. So it's, it's everything you don't get from Gardener's World. Yeah. Uh, or anywhere else, for that matter. Yeah, so it's those things. So, yeah. so it, it, it is. There, yeah, look at that. Well, it's just, it's just a sister, it's a dry garden. And it's the reason, not just a sister, it's, it's a rather lovely sister. It's a nice sister, and it's doing its stuff. And the whole point is that Long Meadow is very wet, heavy clay, we grow some things with great ease, it's very fertile, but Mediterranean plants are not our forte. Mm -hmm. We struggle. So we have an area of the garden we call the dry garden, which actually was an old yard, which is mainly stone. Uh, and I've dug the stone out, actually years ago, with a crowbar and a pick uh, to, to literally excavate stone and cobble and the rest of it. A little bit of soil, so it means plants like sisters yeah. are very happy. And that's been there now for about five years and is doing well. What else have you got in there? Uh, well, we grow, I mean, obviously there are, in front of that, some rosemary, some euphorbias. We have, for example, the grass, uh, Stica gigante. Mm -hmm. Very happy in there. Always dies in our grass borders after about two years. It's yeah. too wet and cold. Yeah. Um, Bearded iris will grow there. We have... Do they stand? Do they fall over? Not there, no. no. So they don't, they're because tough they're enough. tough enough. They do um, a lot of plants that long better fall over. I fall over quite a lot too. <laughs> and I mean, the, the serious point behind that is, if you have a plant that is overfed, either by you or by nature, it's not going to, and genetically, it is disposed to react to given conditions and adapt to it. If you suddenly have a flash of growth, it can't spoil itself. Mm. So do you stake stuff? Mm. Like man, with metal hoops mm. that we make. Um, and a little bit, last like yesterday I was going around with pea sticks because all my peas have been eaten by rabbits. So I've got a surplus of pea sticks. <laughs> uh, so I was using those. But yeah, we stake. And I read other people saying, oh, I never stake. Yeah, yeah. Never stake. Let things stand upright. And if you did that with us, they'd just be flat. Yeah. As soon as you get a rainstorm, on yeah. it, goes, I mean, it, it goes down. That, there's, there's always good and bad. We have really fertile soil. It's a joy. It's a, as a gardener, it's an absolute joy to work. As long as you're prepared to work, because it's quite heavy. Um, but if we, we have a lot of rain, and if we have that with heat, our growth is just tropical and correspondingly floppy. Okay, let's go on next one. <laughs> this is what they've been waiting for. Yeah. If we just show them pictures of dogs, they'd be fine. They would. We could, we, we could have the, the dog show. But I suppose there is a dog show. It's cross sold here. I don't know. Anyway, that's Nigel. We were filming. We were filming on uh, Wednesday. And I know it's Nigel who, when we film, he just lies by me and does what he's told to do, and he does it all day long. It's not a problem for us. Nelly has shot off. The he has a tennis ball. Well, even the tennis ball, he, he lies. He likes the tennis ball, but, but he was still like. And um, I noticed that he put his head under the hedge. 
Uh, so I presume it was just to sort of keep his head cool, which is not a very you know, yeah. wise thing to do. Uh, and he was very happy there, and I think he also slightly thought that he was hiding. <laughs> he said, I've had enough. I can't see you, so therefore you can't see me. We are in a complete state of hiding. Um, what were you doing? Or, or else he was just embarrassed. My God, he's not doing that, is he? Oh no, I can't look. Um, we were in the jaw gun. That's in the jaw gun. And what was I doing? I think I was doing what we call the midway menu. The midway menu. Which is when I say, coming up on tonight's programme, okay. Carol will be tiptoeing through the tulips, <laughs> Adam will be assaulting a tree of some sort, and something else will be happening yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. So it's just, it's just to keep you excited. Yeah. Keep it. Don't turn off. Don't stay. Please. Hang on. on. <laughs> Basically, we're saying, please. Keep watching a little bit longer. Keep watching, there will be more dogs later. Yeah, I, there, there will be dogs. So that's that. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, I took that, yes, I took that last night. That, um, those are three yellows. That's the dual gun. Yellow is traditionally a difficult colour. Mm. And I know people who should be nameless, but who you also know too, who have said very grandly to me, oh God, I've never used yellow in a board. Or too ghastly, my dear. Mm -hmm. I have clients who say that to me. Yeah. No yellow. Do you know what one of my greatest pleasures is? Mm -hmm. Planting a yellow plant in winter and then wait, they won't know that it's yellow until And also the when they say to you, the board is just looking divine, it's wonderful, and you say, yellow, 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 yellow. yellow, yellow. <laughs> what do you think daffodils are, for Christ's sake? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting there because you have strong yellow uh, in spring and then strong yellow when the Rebecca's come and in the middle. This, is, this yellow is called, there are three plants that are doing that. There's thalictrum. Uh, which is growing as a weed, and actually that is growing up through the box hedges, which are heavily affected by box blight, but still alive, so the middles are very bare. So what we're doing is we're letting things seed themselves inside the hedge. Is that not going to make the box blight worse? Yeah, but I think it's a lot of good. The alternative is to grub it out. Yeah. And actually grubbing out a box hedge is quite a job. And because I film every week, and I'm here talking to you, and I have articles to write, and I Actually, to, to do it, tidy it up, and have it ready for filming, we don't have time. So that's, uh, that's to be done in winter, if it's to be done at all. And usually by winter, we think, oh, no, let's do it another year. Yeah. So, things like polytron, foxgloves, poppies, are encouraged to come up through the hedge, which acts as a kind of support, and polytron loves us. Behind that, there is a yellow elder, golden elder, the yeah. uh, and behind that, a golden hop. So you have these shades of, of green and gold and yellow, and I think they look right. Is that deliberate, or is it just something that happens? A bit of both. <laughs> uh, the elder and the hop are very deliberate. Yeah. The philip from the self -sum. It's nature bit. Yeah. It's some, some, sometimes nature does that, and, and, the, and, and the secret of gardening is you then take credit for it. You, you, you then say, that, I can you spot what I've done there? <laughs> uh, Yes, and of course, we're going to see other pictures where accidents, happy accidents, yeah. luckily, happen all the time. Okay. And I suppose the skill is knowing, you say take credit, when to celebrate an accident and when to intervene. Yeah, and when to just actually say, that's a bad idea, yeah. let's take that. Whoops, no. Okay. That's a big deal. Next one. Now this, this is an obscure plant. It's on the mound. If you live in America, it's not obscure at all. It's called Petila. Yeah. And uh, it's a complete tangle of branches, the most unruly little tree you've ever seen, until it flowers and comes to leaf. It's the last plant in the garden to show any signs of life at all. It doesn't put on a hint of leaf until well into May. So you're sitting there panicking, saying... You're, uh, honestly, it genuinely looks dead. Yeah. It doesn't just, uh, you know, it, you, you just get the pen knife out and start scratching yeah. the bark and all that business. And then a little bit of leaf starts to appear. And then you notice it is covered in fire. And it's got a delicious honey smell. Mm -hmm. And the bees like it more than any other plant I've ever made. They it's adore it. It's covered in bees. Yes, that is completely covered in bees. And it's one of those plants that, when we're filming Gardener's World, I'll say, look, isn't that great? I'll say, yeah, but who's ever heard of the tea? You know? So they're you not actually going to film it. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, can you buy it in the garden centre? Probably not. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, move on. We won't do that. But that's so, so that's on the mound, which is a relatively new business. Well, the mound, the mound. We've always called the mound because when we started making the garden back in 1992, we had a spoil heap. And it was partly building spoil, it was partly where we made cars and we dug out subsoil and we replaced it with a carb core. It was part, you know, just every garden accumulates spoil of some kind, particularly if you're laying poles, I guess. And over the years, and that's when we had our bonfires, so 20 years worth of bonfires and all the ash and all the rest of it, uh, and it grew up as a mound. And then we got a digger in and, and leveled it out, and for about 10 years it was just grass, tightly mown. A little like a mot of a mot and baby, and then the BBC came along, and it was this insatiable desire for <laughs> content, uh, not to say jeopardy, that television word. Uh, what can we do with this rather nice space? But one yeah. very simple thing has happened, uh, and so I started to plant it up, which is what I've done mm -hmm. gradually. It's and, evolved, and so this was your choice. Oh, I'm oh, just yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's be clear, the BBC are incredibly good at working with me as the creator and owner and occupant of the garden. They never ask me to do anything that I don't want to do. They might, well, they might ask me, but they never... <laughs> they get a flea in their ear. They get a flea in their ear. And also they are very respectful of the fact that Sarah and I and the children live there. It's our home. Yeah. And also that it's Sarah's garden as much as anything else. And they are, I think actually, I mean, it sounds creepy, but they are exemplary in the way that they behave. They couldn't manage it better. And there, there are bits of the garden that are off limits. And yeah, we have, we, we've never seen. We have three, four separate areas in the garden. Two courtyards, one outside the back door and one outside the garden door, uh, that they never go into. And the doors are always shut when we're filming. And then from the front courtyard, which is very nice actually, I like it, uh, we go into a wall garden, which we used to film in, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And as now is Sarah's garden. And the basis being is that nothing can happen in there that has any relationship to television. Right. You know, it's, it's, all, it's never photographed, it's no television. It's so what's in it? Well, what's in it is what we planted, we planted years ago. Mm -hmm. I bought with my collection of roses, which wasn't very bad, there were about 60 old roses I had. Uh, herbaceous plants, climbers, there are a lot of figs in there, there's a sort of, we eat there, there's lots of pots, mm -hmm. uh, there are some ewes, there's clip box. Um, there's wonderful, actually, marvellous climbing rose, there's pools in there, must be lovely, scrambling all over the end. Uh, it's very loose, it's very free, it's lovely. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favourite bits of the garden, but you're never going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's important. I would say is it's what I've learned over the years. There have to be demarcation lines, and the crew like it as much as I do because they know where the lines are. Yeah. You know, there is a thing you do not film the house yeah. in any way that can be recognisable from outside the garden. Yeah. That's contractual, and they respect that. Uh, they don't go through those doors, you know, we don't do certain things. Yeah. So it means everybody can relax, you know where we are. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next one. That's on the mound too. That is? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, that's the mound. Okay. So the patina is actually... Oh, I see, yeah. ...is to just have a shot there. Yeah. And the whole point about this picture is that the mound and the whole of, of Long Meadow we use colour themes a lot. The jewel garden the jewel colours, yeah. the cottage garden the pastel colours, the writing garden is white, the orchard beds are sort of pinks and purples through that range. The mound is planted in whites, pale yellows, pale blues. Mm -hmm. That's the colour. So, so it's understandable for me not to think that that's the mound. And the whole point of that picture, and, and with Instagram you always put a little note underneath, or at least I do, is that the, we've been colour-bombed by poppies. And they're all self-sown, they're all opium poppies, and in fact there's a few fox girls in there too. And they aren't remotely white or pale yellow or okay. pale blue. Okay. They're every shade of red and pink, and hurrah for that. Great. They, they are full of joy. Yeah. Basically. And the whole thing about poppies is that a poppy seed is a little colour bomb waiting to go. 
uh, and in fact the, the sort of profound implications are that one of the images of the First World War are poppies, and we wear a poppy. And the reason for that is that poppy seed will lie in meadow or uncultivated ground for a hundred years or so. And then when it's ploughed or disturbed, i.e. by artillery shells, the disturbed soil and light triggers germination. And so suddenly you will have a flush of poppies, yeah. which is what happened in Flanders as a result of artillery fire, in what happens in a garden as a result of digging. Mm. And they're also quite resistant to composting. Yeah. So you put your poppies on the compost heap, they tend to go through the composting system, you put them, you, you spread the compost as mulch, or if you plant a plant or whatever, you dig, you have the perfect environment for the seeds to suddenly go, we're off. Well, I, have, I have a sort of river of poppies that sort of run through, which is precisely where the compost, I bought some compost and then used my own, and you can see exactly where it starts. Yeah, yeah. and so that, that's what happens. Yeah. And it happens all over our garden, every year, and they are allowed, they are very, very welcome, uninvited guests. Do you pull them out before they set seed? Uh, only the ones whose colours I don't like. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, which are quite a lot, because poppies are, are very promiscuous and they crossbreed. Very, very difficult to get a really true poppy. But, so a lot of it is happy accident. Mm -hmm. But I work on the basis, and it's the same with hellebores actually, is that a, a very boring poppy, along with a rather beautiful poppy, are unlikely to produce a beautiful poppy. They're yeah. more likely to produce a boring poppy. Right. So if you take out all the boring ones, and just leave the good ones, yeah. you've got more chance of two good ones producing another one. Something, something else, yeah. something with a fringe, something with a... Yeah. Yeah. And we have some production. that are very frilly, some that are exquisite colour, some that are just sort of charming, some that just get it right between that. There's that sort of area between pink and a sort of almost mauvey colour mm -hmm. that can be perfect or it can be muddy. Yeah. And it's, it's such a fine line. And I realize as I'm talking to you that most of my gardening is finessing, is fine tuning. You know, there's a lot of planting and cutting and hedge cutting. Actually, that's not really what it's about. Most of it is about just a little bit that way. Whether it be with color it's because and, you've been gardening that place yeah. for a long time, and that's what yeah. happens as you get into it, really, isn't it? I guess so. Otherwise, there'd be no gardening left to do. We'd all be terribly, terribly bored. <laughs> okay.